is codenamed Dean, the alleged undercover progressive. I want to thank Jake Lamar for the video that I'm responding to. It was a thoughtful and respectful explanation as to why you were not disappointed in Barack Obama. Because of that, I decided that your video was worth the time and energy to craft this response and to explain why so many of us are disappointed in Obama. In the course of my response, I will be making some extraordinary assertions, and extraordinary claims always requires extraordinary evidence. I welcome your skepticism. So everything that I say is backed up with at least one source. If you wish to review my sources, then I invite you to review them at my blog, The Undercover Progressive, which can be found at oldelmtree.com. In your video, you said that you are not disappointed in President Obama because he has, in your words, provided health care coverage for 30 million Americans in need of it. I fear that statistics may paint a very different picture. In 2010, the ranks of the uninsured actually grew by 1.8 million people. But simply having health care insurance isn't enough. In the same year, 29 million Americans had to spend their entire life savings on health care costs, and many of those had health care insurance. In fact, of those Americans who were forced to file for bankruptcy for health care costs, 80% of them had health care insurance. Insurance premiums continue to rise three times faster than wages and four times faster than inflation. If this continues, then the average health care insurance policy will equal the income of the average working American by 2025. Now, you might respond that to Obama's Affordable Health Care Act, which he only signed into law in late of 2009, needs time to work. Much of the act will not come into full force until 2019, and that's still eight years from now. But I ask you in all seriousness, how can you be proud of something? that will not exist in its totality for another eight years. And if the law hasn't been fully implemented, how can you attribute any change, positive or negative, to the passage of the law itself? Instead, I fear, at best, that Obama has only kicked the can down the road. We will have to wait eight years before his solutions come online. In the meantime, the problems will get worse as more Americans will go bankrupt or lose their lives because of a health care delivery system itself continues to decay. Once the law does come online, we will have to wait a few more years before we can truly evaluate whether the Health Care Act is working or not. But why wait eight years for reforms to come online? Taiwan was able to completely reinvent their health care system from scratch in only three months. Of course, they went with a single-payer model instead of extremely complex state-sponsored insurance exchange programs with lots of equally complex and very expensive government subsidies. If Obama followed Taiwan's example, we wouldn't have to wait eight years for health care reform. We would already have it online by now. And it would have been a popular move. Polls consistently show that two-thirds of Americans supported the Medicare for All plan, and this is despite the relentless media campaign against it. Imagine the support it would have had if the great orator himself had made a strong case in favor of this plan. Instead, he elected to support a plan that further entrenched the system that was already despised by a majority of Americans, in favor of only promises that reforms may or may not come about in another decade or so long after Obama has left office. But the worst part is that we already have reason to believe that the Affordable Health Care Act will fail, and that it will fail on two fronts. The first problem is that the market-based reform strategies that the Act will attempt to employ to control these costs, namely the individual mandate and the health insurance exchange markets, have already been tried and have already failed at the state level. The second reason why we know it will fail is because the Affordable Health Care Act only deals with health care insurance, and thus ignores the rest of a long list of crippling issues still negatively impacting our health care system, such as the fact that insurance is not a protection against bankruptcy. 
these issues are not even a part of the debate, let alone part of any reform initiative. Of course, the Affordable Health Care Act is not a perfect bill. Obama even said as much when trying to convince Americans to support it. He said that it was only the first step in a much longer process of reform. I agree. Indeed, the health care crisis that we face today is such a vast and complex issue that it may take dozens of bills to fully address reform in any meaningful manner. The Affordable Health Care Act does contain a number of positive reforms. It would have been a perfect complement to a much larger legislative initiative if it was just the first of many reform bills. So, with that said, where is the second bill? Where is the continuation of the dialogue that Obama promised us before he signed the bill into law? If Obama had other bills waiting for consideration, or if he was simply demanding for further reform in the face of Republican obstinance, I would be inclined to be more patient with Obama. But there is no second bill, and there never was. In my most humble opinion, the debate for health care reform that candidate Obama promised us has yet to even take place. I am compelled to conclude that the Affordable Health Care Act was crafted not for the benefit of the American people, but for health insurance industry, which explains why there was never an effort to craft further legislation. This is one reason why, among many, that I am disappointed in Obama. You said, and I quote, I am not disappointed in a president who has eliminated a terrorist who has tormented the American psyche for 10 years, unquote. Well, with respect and some reluctance, I must point out the vulgarity of taking pride in the elimination of any human being, even a terrorist. Barack Obama may have chosen his words more carefully, but careful wording is still a poor disguise for such sadistic vulgarity, as he too has taken pride in the elimination of terrorists. Because you and Obama seem to share such a cavalier attitude about human life, I do find it interesting that you were more concerned for the, quote, American psyche, rather than, say, the serving of justice for the crimes that Osama bin Laden, a terrorist to whom I suspect you're referring to, may have committed against the American people. In my most humble opinion, the American psyche, as you put it, has more to do with how we regard ourselves and the common values that we share as a nation, rather than any real or imagined threats made against our American homeland. I would argue that the American psyche, or rather I might say the American character, is our dedication to the rule of law which gives us the ability to speak truth to power, the common practice of common justice for all, as well as the devotion to the ideals of equality for all. Over the years, it has become increasingly apparent to me that Obama does not share in these values, which is expressed through the policies that he chooses to embrace for his administration. This would include the use of indefinite detention, extrajudicial assassination, and the indiscriminate use of attack drones. Many of these policies, policies that Obama has significantly expanded, by the way, are holdovers from the previous Bush administration. There are strong arguments that these policies are in blatant violation of the Constitution of the United States, and in some cases may even be regarded as crimes against humanity. Compounding these offenses further is the fact that Obama also shields the Bush administration from any investigation regarding other alleged wrongdoings such as the National Security Administration's warrantless wiretapping, the instigation of a national torture campaign, illegal rendition of prisoners held by the United States, the fabrication of evidence against Iraq regarding the existence of weapons of mass destruction, and the invasion and occupation of Iraq based on the same fabricated evidence. And it gets worse. It appears that Obama is not simply content in suppressing the investigation, into the Bush's fabrication of evidence regarding Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, but may actually be repeating the offense by fabricating his own case for the Iranian nuclear weapons program. 
even if Obama is not out actively fabricating evidence against Iran, he has not challenged the media drumbeat for war. And the rhetoric Obama has in reaction to that drumbeat is nearly identical to the Bush's campaign against Iraq. Obama said in the 2012 State of the Union Address, and I quote, Let there be no doubt. America is determined to prevent Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon. And I will take no options off the table to achieve that goal. But a peaceful resolution of this issue is still possible, and far better, if Iran changes course and meets its obligation." Unquote. But there is no evidence that Iran is developing a nuclear weapon. In fact, we hear repeatedly from the Obama administration that Iran has not made this decision, and that the purpose of added diplomatic pressure is to make sure that they do not make that decision. If deciding not to make a nuclear weapon has produced the sort of draconian response, then the fix is already in. The war with Iran, just as it was with Iraq, is already a foregone conclusion. And the diplomatic measures to avert an inevitable war is simply this administration going through the motions to shield itself from liability in starting that war. For supporting these constitutional abominations and putting us on the path for yet another unjustified war, I am beyond disappointed. I am outraged. You said, I am not disappointed in a president who has tried to maintain the civility with a hostile political opposition. A president who has maintained the dignity of office and has sought constructive compromise. A president who is a shrewd and pragmatic man of reason, who views politics as the art of the possible. But you went on to say that Obama was confronted by Republicans who were so deranged by his very presence in the White House that they have pushed their agenda into the far reaches of right-wing irrationality. That he is being hammered by a right wing that wants to make the art of the possible impossible. This is an interesting observation. Obama is trying to compromise with a political opposition that refuses to compromise. I would call that a profound contradiction, one that needs to be examined further. In 1938, Neville Chamberlain once said these words, My good friends, this is the second time in our history that there has come back from Germany to Downing Street peace with honor. I believe it is a peace for our time, and I now recommend that you go home and sleep quietly in your beds." Unquote. At the time, Chamberlain believed that he had accomplished the impossible that he had forged a long-lasting peace with the uncompromising. Chamberlain could also be viewed as a pragmatist, a man who believed in the art of the possible, and why not? Consider the alternative to Chamberlain's peace initiative, war. And yet, one year later, Great Britain was pulled into World War II. It fell to Winston Churchill to show a very different kind of leadership the kind that girds the people for hardships to come, that pulls them together. The kind of leadership that inspires the strength to endure and the courage to fight. And the uniquely British character to never surrender, not even in spirit. I do not fault Chamberlain for his desire for peace, or even his willingness to achieve that peace through compromise. No. I believe that Chamberlain's mistake was in thinking that peace was even possible, when in reality war was already upon them. In my most humble opinion, Obama is making the same mistake. His language of bipartisanship is dependent on the notion that peace is possible with Republican conservatives. That is simply a matter of finding the right grand bargain that would bring peace for our time. But instead of appeasing Republicans, he only ends up enraging them further. The case in point would be the individual mandate found in the Affordable Health Care Act. The individual mandate was the cornerstone of Republican reform. And I ask you, could you 
there be anything more pragmatic than the adoption of your opposition's central demand. Republicans should be celebrating the Affordable Health Care Act as a vindication of their ideas. But Republicans have, in fact, turned on the individual mandate, even to the point of vilifying the Republicans who fought so hard to realize such initiatives back when they were essential to Republican thinking. I believe that it's quite apparent why they turned on the individual mandate, because Obama embraced it. This speaks volumes about the confidence that Republicans invest in their own ideas. And it is exactly these ideas that Obama wishes to explore for a constructive compromise. The reality is that America is now embroiled in a cold civil war. Religious Christian conservatives seek to use the power of the American state to enforce a Christian theocracy. And corporate interests have all but taken over all three branches of government. Do you really think that it's wise to compromise with these sorts of interests? And yet, compromise remains the central theme of Obama's presidency. While you might celebrate this as pragmatism, I would argue that Obama compromises because it is the only thing he can do. Because as a pragmatist, he has no vision of the future that is his own. He can only express a vision of the existing powers that reside over him. Without a vision of his own, Obama is condemned to slowly passing the Republican agenda piece by piece. At his best, he can only slow its progress, never halting it, and certainly never challenging it. It is my most humble opinion that pragmatism is the opposite of leadership. Pragmatism is not, as you said, the art of the possible, but rather it is the habit of acquiescence. You warned us that if we didn't support President Obama that we need to consider the Republican alternative. Your implication is quite clear. A Republican administration would be far worse than anything that Obama would or could do. Obviously, I do not share this conclusion. When Obama retains former Bush cabinet members suppresses the investigations into some of Bush's illegal programs, adopts and expands other Bush illegal programs, continues the erosion of our civil liberties, and replicates the path to an illegal and unjustified war, then tell me exactly how is Obama a better alternative? Indeed, if Obama insists on compromising with Republicans, then obviously Obama thinks Republicans' ideas are worth considering. It is a contradiction to then insist that we cannot allow them to win the next election. If Republicans were truly that bad, Obama would not be so quick to compromise with them, let alone to insist on the necessity of compromise. Forgive me for saying this, but alluding to how bad Republicans are is an intellectual fallacy. Nothing bespeaks more of intellectual bankruptcy than trying to elicit support for your side by attempting to install fear for the opposition. In closing, allow me to answer your final question. You asked, if not Obama, then who else? This is not a difficult question for me to answer. I would want, no, I would demand, a president who is a fighter, one who would call us to action, to hold the line, even against impossible odds. Not a president who sends us to bed with false assurances of bipartisan victories. I would demand a real leader, one who commands his own vision of the future. Not a pragmatist who is only capable of echoing the visions of his political and financial superiors. I would demand a president who represents and defends the rights and liberties of his fellow citizens. Not a president who is only interested in protecting the rights of consumers. I would demand a president who inspires his fellow citizens to action, even to sacrifice if necessary. Not a president who declares a victory around every corner and then in the same breath admits to us that we still have a long road ahead of us. I would demand a president who makes mistakes, who will even fail on occasion because we frequently learn more through our failures 
than we do our successes. And failure bespeaks of an effort to achieve difficult goals against a determined resistance. It would demand a president who listens to the informed opinions of activists, researchers, and scientists who would use their expertise in crafting legislation and who takes seriously, even depends upon, the valid critiques of his policies. If this is, as you said, an impossible dream of a progressive presidency, then all hope of restoring the true potential of the American character is truly gone, and the Republican opposition has already won. But that opposition will have won only because we have surrendered. The very spirit of America was built upon the impossible dreams of our forefathers. The ideas of justice, freedom, and liberty for all were carved from solid blocks of tyranny and oppression guarded by invincible military powers and wielded by kings who said to be the hand of God himself. It was America, through freedom of religion, which found a way to overcome religious intolerance and persecution, a force that still dominates much of the earth today in never-ending warfare and violence. It was America, by way of our constitution, the rule of law, the ideals of equality for all citizens, which finally buried the tyranny of the aristocracy. It was America that established the idea that we are to be regarded as innocent until proven guilty, to be held accountable by the jury of our peers, and to have our guilt established by the preponderance of evidence that finally tamed the power of the state itself, transforming it from a tool of tyranny to the guardians of a free society. We fought a bloody civil war in this country to end the abomination of slavery. 140,000 men laid down their lives on the battlefield for this cause. But while we were able to break open the shackles of slavery in order to make them free, we could not give them the liberty. It was the sons and daughters of those slaves who earned their liberty and freedom, but not by force of arms that it took to smash those shackles, by their, but by their selfishness, their courage, and their strength of character, through peaceful resistance. It was their contribution that showed America the way to conquer bigotry and racism. It was then the women of America who threw down the subjugation through gender, so that they could be citizens in their own rights, to own property, to vote, and to have power over their own destiny. When the first Europeans set foot upon this continent, these ideas were the very definition of the impossible dream. But it was the promise of America, that of a new world, that beckoned to the possibilities of such dreams. It was the American spirit that declared our right to fight for the impossible dreams. And it was the myth of America that taught us that even the impossible dreams of liberty, of freedom, and justice for all can indeed become the founding principles of a nation. I have seen nothing from President Barack Obama or in any of the arguments that he has made or those made in his defense. That leads me to even suspect he has any understanding of such possibilities. Is it any wonder then that he does not fight, that he has no vision of his own? You said that you are not disappointed in Obama because he is a pragmatist. I am disappointed in Obama because he is capable of being nothing more than a pragmatist.